Welcome to Drama Recaps. Today, our spotlight is on the 2020 film, The Mauritanian, a narrative based on real events. Beware, spoilers are on the way. In November 2001, two months after the notorious September 11th terrorist attack, we find ourselves in Mauritania. Mohamedou Ould Slahi has just returned home from Germany, much to the delight of his relatives. Amid the celebratory reunion, an acquaintance requests his assistance with a visa for his scientifically inclined nephew. As the festivities continue, Americans appear on the scene looking for Mohamedou. They seek information about his cousin, a suspected member of Bin Laden's group. Mohamedou denies any knowledge of his cousin's whereabouts and later quietly deletes all his contacts. His mother worries that he might not come back. Fast forward to 2005 in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Lawyer Nancy Hollander is seen requesting a case file from her young colleague, Terry Duncan. A chance encounter with a friend on the street leads her to a Moroccan lawyer representing a local judge. He shares the tale of Mohamed's inexplicable disappearance that has left his family in the dark for three years. Now, he is alleged to be one of the masterminds behind the September 11th attacks. When Nancy's attempts to gather information about the prisoner are denied, she decides to legally represent Mohamedou, believing his detention without trial is unlawful. Terry agrees to join her on a mission to Cuba as her assistant. In another part of town, Lt. Col. Stuart Couch is engaged in a conversation with his friends about the ongoing cases against the 9-11 terrorists. One of his friends was aboard a plane that crashed into one of the towers. Couch is handed Mohamedou Slahi's case and is tasked with pressing charges, given the allegations that Mohamedou recruited the individual who directed the plane towards the South Tower. Arriving in Guantanamo, Nancy and Terry are surprised to find Mohamedou is a pleasant man who speaks English, while Mohamedou is shocked to see lawyers after enduring years of 18-hour interrogations without knowing the charges against him. Nancy requests that he signs a document allowing them to represent him in court. He complies hesitantly, and requests a phone call to his mother, but Nancy cautions him that the phone number must be verified first. Simultaneously, Stuart Coach reviews all the data related to Mohamed Slahi, the man he is driven to sentence to death. The military has adroitly exploited Stuart's personal loss, morphing him into an Avenger. Nancy believes they need to visit Virginia as they've received a letter from Mohamedou. She also advises Terry that while her skepticism is understandable, and Mohamedou might indeed be guilty, their primary objective is to free him from his unlawful imprisonment. In Virginia, they are escorted into a heavily secured room within the privacy department, where they find two envelopes containing Mohamedou's letters. They believe that if the government won't disclose the details of the case, they will have to uncover the truth on their own. Meanwhile, Slahi recalls his experiences from August 5, 2002. He was shaved, handcuffed, injected with something, and then photographed. The following day, he was subjected to an interrogation, where they kindly asked about his past and his alleged training with Al-Qaeda. Stewart, on the other hand, meets with the widow of his deceased friend in church and assures her that he will seek retribution for her loss, believing he is serving justice. But is it really justice? During one of his prayers, Mohamedou hears a voice from the other side of the bars. Unable to identify the speaker due to the thick green canvas, they exchange names, the man from Marseille would be Marcel, and Slahi, from Mauritania, would be Marish. The only identifiable detail about Marcel is his prisoner number, 241. The government denies any knowledge about him, asserting that he doesn't exist. Stewart learns that Nancy Hollander is representing Mohamedou's case. He's made aware of several inconsistencies in the Slahi case protocols, with the only consistent detail being the signature of one of his acquaintances. Stewart seeks access to this case data but is met with rejection. In the privacy department, crucial details in Slahi's letters are obscured. During interrogations, it's revealed that a member of Al-Qaeda had reported Mohamedou, possibly naming him under duress. The interrogators claim that Mohamedou is guilty of recruiting for Al-Qaeda, and unless he proves otherwise, he'll face severe consequences. During a conversation with Marcel, Mohamedou reminisces about his school days when he won a scholarship to study in Germany. In 2005, the government permits access to classified information. 
Nancy receives boxes full of files, but most of the information is obscured. Stuart, too, receives similar files but without any redaction. Under immense pressure to expedite the case, Stuart revisits his old comrade requesting access to classified information. However, he's turned down and advised to directly seek access from the general in Guantanamo. Back in Guantanamo, Nancy and Terry share news from Mohamedou's mother. Terry inadvertently mentions the privacy department's role in reading and assessing the secrecy level of his letters. This revelation infuriates Mohamedou, who assumed his communication was strictly between him and Nancy. Nevertheless, Nancy manages to pacify him and persuades him to sue the government. In Guantanamo, Nancy encounters Stuart. He invites her for a beer, paving the way for a difficult conversation. Stuart is certain of his impending victory, even going as far as to admonish Nancy for defending what he refers to as a monster. However, Nancy counters his assuredness, questioning what if he has been misled all along. On their return flight, Nancy proposes a change in their defensive strategy. She suggests they must find someone else besides Mohamedou to defend. Stewart visits the detention facility and is appalled by the harsh conditions the prisoners endure. The cell temperature is a frigid 11 degrees, a fact that the general fails to justify. Meanwhile, Mohamedou is improving his English and attempts to establish a human connection with the guard, albeit unsuccessfully. Marcel is disheartened by a letter from his wife. He is saddened by the fact that he can only receive her words, not see her. Mohamedou reminisces about his first love in Germany and how witnessing world events on TV compelled him to defend his homeland, even fighting alongside America. However, the complication lies in his training with Al-Qaeda from 1990 to 1992. When the investigation questions why he deleted all his contacts at the time of his arrest, he explains that he simply wanted to protect his friends. This reasoning doesn't convince the investigators. Despite the growing adversities, Mohamedou remains hopeful, assuring Marcel that they will eventually escape and return home. Nancy is interviewed and asked why she is defending a terrorist. She clarifies that her commitment is to justice. One of Stewart's associates who requested information gets fired. Nancy is informed that they couldn't locate the man from Marseille, whom Mohamedou was in contact with. Mohamedou learns from a guard that his friend Marcel died a month ago, allegedly by suicide. During his outdoor time, Mohamedou glimpses the sea through a hole in the canvas, reminding him of the Sea of Marseille that Marcel often spoke about. This information overwhelms him emotionally, and he offers prayers for all, the living and the dead. Nancy and Terry face public backlash, with protesters waving American flags and reminding them of the horrors of September 11th. The judge rules in favor of Nancy, granting them access to the unclassified case files of Mohamedou Slahi. Upon reviewing the files, Terry is shocked to find that Mohamedou confessed to all the accusations against him. Terry feels betrayed, having sacrificed so much for what now appears to be a lost cause. However, Nancy is not swayed by Terry's frustrations and suggests that if she wishes to quit, she should, while Nancy continues with the case. Terry, feeling disheartened and not believing in the case anymore, leaves in tears. Mohamedou, in his solitude, remembers his transition from civil interrogators to military custody, recalling the ominous warning that the military would be less courteous. A bag was placed over his head, marking the beginning of harsher treatment. Nancy visits Slahi, informing him of Terry's departure and confronting him about his confession. Mohamedou insists that his confession was extracted under duress. Nancy retorts that it's precisely why he should be writing letters, to reveal the truth. However, this aggravates Mohamedou, who has lost all hope of ever leaving the prison. Nancy firmly states that if Mohamedou doesn't write letters, she will find him another lawyer. Stewart confronts his friend Neil, accusing him of withholding information. Mohamedou remembers that it was Neil who subjected him to torture and coerced him into confessing to the murder. He transcribes these painful memories into a letter. Mohamedou is relocated to another cell that lacks a Quran and has unfavorable temperatures. Nancy receives a new letter from him. Neil visits Stewart's office late at night, revealing what transpired during those dark days and presents him with classified memos. 
That night, both Stuart and Nancy discover the horrifying truth of what happened at Guantanamo. Mohamedou was subjected to sleep deprivation, blaring music, waterboarding, physical assault, sexual humiliation, and mockery of his infertility. The threat of arresting his mother finally broke him, compelling him to disclose all the instances of maltreatment. The sustained torture over several months took a toll on his sanity. When he was virtually incoherent, they threatened him with the detention of his mother in the same jail. This pushed him to confess to crimes he didn't commit, turning him into a scapegoat. Stewart, grappling with the grave reality of the situation, visits a church. He then turns down the person who assigned him the case, refusing to press charges. He is branded a traitor. Nancy visits Mohamedou to offer support and suggests publishing all his letters as a book. Stewart packs his belongings and leaves his workplace. He is publicly vilified and tarnished as a traitor in newspapers. Stewart and Nancy agree to work together, with Stewart asking her to inspect box number 32 containing the polygraph results which were twice positive. Nancy shares these with Terry, who has managed to locate the family of prisoner 241. Nancy convinces Terry to return to work on the case. In 2009, Slahi gives a poignant speech about racism and his grueling eight-year incarceration during a meeting via video link from prison. In 2010, he receives a letter at Guantanamo stating that he has won his case and will be going home. Despite this victory, Slahi would spend another seven years in prison. Slahi never gets to see his mother again, who passes away in 2013. Nancy and Terry continue to support him till his release. In 2015, Slahi's book documenting his experiences is published and becomes a bestseller. He is released on October 17, 2016, after spending 14 years and two months in prison without any charges pressed against him. He returns to Mauritania, marries a lawyer named Kitty, and they have a son, Ahmed. <laughs>